And I've chosen to begin with silence. And I'll tell you why. Because any way to God has to be a way through silence. If you ever come to union with God, you must pass through silence. What is this silence? Let me explain it to you by means of a simple tale that we have in the East. There is this great king who goes to visit a spiritual master. And he says to the master, I'm a busy man. Could you tell me how I could be united with God, but give it to me in one sentence? And the master says to him, I'll give it to you in one word. What is that word, says the king. And the master says, silence. And how would I get silence, says the king? Meditation, says the master. Meditation, incidentally, in the East, the Sanskrit word dhyan, that means not thinking about, but going beyond the thinking. So the master says, meditation. And the king says, and what is meditation? To which the master replies, silence. How will I find God? Silence. And what is, how do I get silence? Meditation. And what is meditation? Silence. Well, I imagine while I was telling this tale that you got the secret. Silence means going beyond words and thoughts. What's wrong with words and thoughts? You know what's wrong with them? They're very wonderful. But God is nothing like what we say he is, and he is nothing like what we imagine or think he is. That is what is wrong with words and thoughts. And most people will not accept this. They cling to their images of God, and that is the biggest obstacle to their getting to silence. Would you like to experience this silence that I'm talking about? Well, you'll have to do three things, which I'm going to recommend in this program. The first is understanding. Understanding what? Understanding that God isn't anything like the idea that you have of God. You know, in the country I come from, India, we've got plenty of roses. But let's suppose that I had never smelt a rose in my life. And I say to you, what is the smell, the fragrance of a rose? Could you describe that? Go on, describe it. You see, if you cannot describe a simple thing like the fragrance of a rose, how could anybody describe the experience of God? Whatever words he uses, they're quite inadequate. God is totally beyond that. So now you have it. That's what is wrong with the words. There is this great mystic who wrote the Cloud of Unknowing, a great Christian book. And he says, do you want to know God? There's only one way of knowing him. You know him through non-knowing. You have to get out of your mind and your thinking. Then you may grasp him with the heart. And St. Thomas Aquinas, that great Christian theologian, says about God, only this can be said with certainty, that we do not know what he is. You know, that is what the church tells us in very solemn language in the Second Lateran Council. She says, any image that we have of God is more unlike him than like him. Now, I know what some of you are going to say to me. You're going to say, if that is true, what about scripture? Well, scripture doesn't give us a picture of God doesn't give us a description of God, it gives us a direction. Because no words can give us a picture of God. Let me explain that. You know, in my country, India, let's suppose I'm walking towards Bombay. And then I come to the signpost that says Bombay. And then I say, well, what do you know? Here it is, Bombay. And I look at it and go back. And people say to me, did you get to Bombay? I say, oh, yes, I got to Bombay. What is it like? You know, it's like a, well, it's like a board, see, painted yellow, 
and there are words on it. Uh, the one looks like a B, one looks, do you see that? I missed the point because that signpost isn't Bombay. In fact, it isn't like Bombay at all. It isn't a picture of Bombay. It's a pointer. That is what scripture is, a pointer. In the East, we have a saying, when the wise man points to the moon, all that the fool sees is the finger. Imagine that I am pointing to the moon and I say, moon. And you come running up and say, oh, is this the moon? And you're looking at the finger. This is the danger and the tragedy of words. Words are beautiful. Father, what a lovely word to indicate God. But the church herself teaches us that is a mystery. God is a mystery. And if you take that word, Father, too literally, you'll get into trouble because people will be asking you, what kind of a father is this that he allows so much suffering? See, a mystery, unknowable, unintelligible, beyond the mind. One more way of showing you the same thing, but I think you'll find it profitable. Imagine that there is a man born blind, and he says to me, what is this color green that everybody's talking about? How would you describe that to him? Impossible. And then he says, listen to his questions. He says, uh, is it hot or is it cold? Is it long or is it short? Is it rough or is it smooth? It is none of these things. Because the poor man is asking the questions from his limited experience. But let's suppose I were to try. I'd say, you know, that color green, I'll tell you what it's like. It's like soft music. Then one day, the man recovers his sight. And I say to him, well, did you see the color green? He says, no. You know why? Because he's looking for soft music. He got stuck to that idea of green being soft music. So when he was looking at green, the color green, he failed to recognize it. That's another story we have in the East of this little fish in the ocean. Somebody tells the fish, what a mighty thing the ocean is. Great, marvelous. And so this little fish is swimming everywhere in search of the ocean, in the ocean. And all he finds is water. See, he failed to recognize. He got stuck to that word, ocean. Now, can it be that that is happening to us? Can it be that God is staring us in the face, but because we are clinging to some ideas, we fail to recognize him? That would be a tragedy, wouldn't it? So then we come to the second thing. I told you the first thing, if you want to attain to silence and you want to get to God, is understanding a readiness to realize that your ideas of God are all inadequate. And lots of people are not ready to realize that. And that's the big obstacle to prayer and to meditation in their case. The second thing you need to do if you want to get silence, it is, now get ready, because some of you are going to think that this is absurd. It's almost incredible. But all you need to do is look, listen hear, see, that's all, that's all. Let me explain that. You know, in the East we say, God created the world. God dances the world. Can you think of a dancer and his dance? They're one thing, they're not the same thing, but they're not two. There's a great English theologian who put it in as lovely and as profound a way. He said, God is in creation the way the voice of a singer is in a song. Let's suppose I were to sing a song. Let's suppose I were to say, Nearer my God to thee. You've got my voice. You've got the song. So intimately connected, though they're not the same thing. Now listen to this, isn't it strange that we would be listening to the song 
and we don't hear the voice, that we're looking at the dance and we don't see the dancer? Isn't it strange that we should hear the song and not hear the voice? That we can see the dance and we do not recognize the dancer? Now you might say to me, well, does it mean that if we just look we will be given the grace of seeing and of recognizing? No. You may be given the grace of seeing and recognizing because this calls for a special way of seeing. You remember that lovely book, The Little Prince? The fox says something to the prince there that is marvelously put. He says, it is only with the heart that one sees rightly. What is essential is invisible to the eye. So what you need is heart hearing, heart seeing. There is an admirable Japanese tale that brings this out very well. This disciple goes to his master and he says, you are hiding the final secret of contemplation from me. And the master says, no, I'm not. And the disciple says, oh, yes, you are. Well, one day they happened to be walking along the mountainside. And they heard a bird sing. And the master said to the disciple, did you hear that bird sing? And the disciple said, yes. And the master said, well, now you know that I haven't hidden anything from you. And the disciple said, yes. You know what had happened? He had attained heart hearing, heart listening. This is a gift that may be given to us if we would look. Another way of putting the same thing. You know, I keep giving you these various comparisons because some people will be helped by some and others by others. Imagine that I am looking at the sunset and a peasant comes to me and says, what are you looking at? You seem all enraptured. And I say, I'm enraptured by the beauty. And the poor man comes every day at evening to look for beauty. I mean, where, where is this beauty? He said, well, he can see the sun, he can see the clouds, he can see the trees, but beauty. He doesn't realize that beauty isn't a thing. Beauty is a way of looking at things. See, look at creation. Hopefully, someday, heart looking will be given to you. And when you're looking at creation, don't look for anything sensational now. You know, you may have heard of the God experience and you're nothing sensational. Just look, just observe. And don't look at ideas, look at creation. And hopefully it will be given to you because you will become quiet as you look and silence will overtake you. And then you may see. That is what is brought out so beautifully in the gospel according to John, where we are told in the first chapter, all things were created in him and through him. And then we have that lovely sentence which says, he was in the world, for the world was created by him, but the world did not recognize him. If you would look, maybe you will recognize. Look at the dance. Hopefully you will spot the dancer. So those are two things I gave you now as a help to attain silence, understanding and looking, hearing. There is a final thing that I'd like to recommend as a help to attaining silence, and that is the scriptures. The scripture is par excellence, the finger pointing to the moon. So we use the words of scripture to go beyond the words and to attain silence. How would you do that? You take a passage from the scriptures. I'm going to give you one of my favorites. 
John 7. You have it right here. And you begin to read. On the last day and the greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood up and cried aloud. Anyone who is thirsty should come to me and drink. Now let's suppose as you're reading that, you're gripped by that sentence. What do you do then? You recite that sentence in your heart and you stop the reading. Anyone who is thirsty should come to me and drink. Anyone who is thirsty should come to me and drink. Something like a mantra. You keep saying it again and again until your heart is satisfied, until your heart is saturated. You don't think explicitly on the meaning of those words now because your heart knows the meaning. And when you have come to that point of satisfaction, then you react to the words. How would you react? Well, some people may react this way. They may say, anyone, do you really mean that, Lord? Anyone, saint, sinner, well, here I come, give me to drink. Or someone else may react by saying, I don't believe a word of this. What is this drink that you talk about? I have come to you so often in the past and you have given me nothing. That's all right. Here is someone who is frustrated, who is angry, and it's perfectly all right to talk to the Lord like that. Very good prayer, because you're honestly telling him what you have in your heart. Yet another person might say, I know exactly what you are talking about, Lord, because I have come to you in the past and you have given me to drink. Well, here I come again. So that is the way you react. Now, it is perfectly possible that a time will come when you will tire of reacting in words, when there will be sentiments welling up in your heart that will be so deep and so rich that no words will be able to express them. And all that you will be able to do will be to stay there helplessly in silence, responding to those words and to the Lord who said those words beyond any words that you could use. And you keep to that silence as long as you are not distracted. When you are becoming distracted again, then pick up the book and continue to read until you alight upon another sentence. And so you see, here is a way of using the words of the scripture to go beyond the words into silence. It is read, recite, and react. And gradually the reaction will be silence. There's another way you can use the scriptures, and it is this. You get into silence first. You know, I suggested looking and listening. In future programs, I will suggest other things, like being aware of your breathing, be aware of the sensations of your body. That will bring you into silence. And when you get into this deep stillness, you recall a sentence of scripture or get someone to read a sentence of scripture to you. And you know what will happen? Those words of scripture will be sort of etched in your heart. They will have such a powerful meaning for you and they will deepen your silence because they will have a meaning which is quite beyond the mind. Won't those words that somebody reads disturb your silence? Oh no. It's like, you know, the quiet and the peace of the evening, and then you hear the temple bell, or you hear the, hear the church bell ringing. And you know, that sound deepens your silence. So that's what's likely to happen to you if you get into silence and then have a sentence of scripture read to you, or you read it yourself, or you recall it. Let me give you a variation of what I was saying when I first began to talk about scripture a few minutes ago. You can do this right after this program. You don't even have to open your Bibles for it. 
take some of those lovely, lovely sentences that Jesus says in the New Testament. How beautiful they are. Come, follow me. Everything is possible to someone who believes. Do you believe that I can do this? Or that other sentence, peace, don't be afraid, it is I. Or that other sentence, do you love me? Now let's suppose you were to choose that sentence, do you love me? Imagine that Jesus Christ is standing right here in front of you and he addresses those words to you. Now you must resist the temptation to react. Don't say anything. Don't respond. Let the words reverberate within your heart. Let them resound within your being. And when you cannot contain it anymore, then react. Then give him your response. You know what's likely to happen here? You are likely to get into silence long before the response. A very simple and a very effective way of getting into silence. So you may want to try this at the end of the program. Let me summarize for you what I have said to you in this program. I have given you three royal ways to silence, three exercises. The first, to understand that God is nothing at all like what we think he is. The second, to look, to hear. Now, mind you, I don't want you to think that by your looking, you will create that silence. You cannot, because the silence I'm talking about is divine. It is a gift. You know, it is something like, let's say, someone who cannot go to sleep. He suffers from insomnia. You cannot create sleep, but you can do something. You could lie down or whatever in the hope that sleep will be given to you. So the second exercise, looking. And the third, scripture, using the word of God to get into silence. At the end of this program, I invite you to stay on here and to try that simple exercise that I gave you, to imagine that Jesus is standing in front of you and he addresses to you one of those lovely words of the, of the Gospels and you react, hold in your reaction in the beginning and then when you can hold it in no more, you speak to him. What I want to do now is tell you a story which will bring out the whole spirituality of this looking and this hearing that I spoke of. Because you know I hold that a story is the shortest distance between a human being and truth. So this is the story. There was a temple built on an island about two miles away from the mainland. That's where the island stood. And in that temple, there were a thousand silver bells, large bells, small bells, bells made by the best craftsmen in the world. And every time the wind blew or the storm raged, the bells would peal out. And it was said that anyone who heard those bells would be enraptured and would be taken into a deep experience of God. Well, as the centuries passed, the island sank into the sea. And with the island, the temple and the bells. But the tradition persisted that those bells now rang out continuously. And if anyone had the gift of hearing them, that person would still be transported into God. Well, a young man was inspired by this legend and he undertook a journey of hundreds of miles till he came to the spot opposite to which it was said that the temple had stood centuries ago. He sat under a tree, a large coconut tree, and he began to strain to hear the sound of those bells.
but no matter what he did, all he could hear was the roar of the waves as they splashed against the shore, as they dashed against a nearby cliff. And that irritated him because he tried his level best to push that sound out so that he would get into silence and hear the sound of those bells. Well, to no effect. He tried for a week and for four weeks and for eight weeks and then it became three months. Occasionally when he became discouraged, he would hear the village elders at night talk about the tradition and about the people who had been given this grace and his heart would glow within him. But he knew that a glowing heart was no substitute for hearing those bells. Well, after he had tried it out for six or eight months, he decided to give it up. Maybe the legend wasn't true, or maybe the grace was not meant for him. He said goodbye to the people he was living with, and then he went to the shore to say goodbye to that favorite coconut tree of his, and the sky, and the sea. And as he sat there, he began to listen to the sound of the waves, strange. It wasn't a jarring sound. He discovered for the first time that it was a soothing sound. And it relaxed him, and he became silent. And as the silence went deeper and deeper, something happened. He heard the tinkle of a little bell, and he jumped up and thought, I must be producing this. I must be suggesting this to myself. And once again, he began to listen to the sound of the sea and relaxed and became silent. And the silence became deeper. And he heard it again, the tinkle of a little bell. And before he could jump up this time, it was followed by another and another and another and another. And soon he was hearing the glorious symphony of a thousand temple bells pealing out in unison. And he was transported out of himself and was given the grace of being united with God. The moral of the story is, if you want to hear the sound of the bells, listen to the sound of the sea. If you want to recognize the dancer, look at the dance. If you want to hear the voice of the singer, listen to the song. Look, listen. Hopefully, someday it will be given to you to see and to recognize in silence.